Right, good evening, one and all. Um, my name is David Hughes, FRAS, Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, if you are asking. Tonight's members talk is a gentle introduction to astronomy, astronomy and cosmology. Um, I'm trying to get my screen working. Right, how are we going to do this? I'm going to assume that everybody can see what I'm doing and hear my voice. So, the initial three questions are, what is astronomy? Why we do astronomy? And what's out there? The sort of objects that are out there that you can see, some of which you'll be able to see tonight. Can amateurs make a difference? Obviously, if you're going to get into astronomy, you want to know, is there any point in getting into astronomy? Is there actually any point in going outside and looking at the sky for myself? Well, yes, there is. Actually, there really is. Astronomers, amateur astronomers, can and do make a real difference to the field of astronomy in a very important context. Then we're going to look at what we can see in the sky tonight. So I'm just going to check. Uh, we've got a couple of questions to make sure I haven't got anything odd going on. I can't see anything odd. Right. Okay, right. Now then, give me a second. Right. What can we see tonight? And then we'll have... Oh, my screen's acting up. Question and answers for about 10 minutes. Okay. Right. First off, what's astronomy? What is astronomy? Astronomy is the study of objects in the sky. We don't do astronomy just at night. We do astronomy during the day as well. And astronomy is that how the, the real, what really is a, the guts about astronomy, what it's all about is how those discoveries relate to life here on Earth. That's the most important thing about it. How is we can feed what we learn in the sky back down onto Earth. Astronomy is almost certainly the oldest science. The only other science that we could think that competes with astronomy is probably agriculture. Astronomy is almost certainly the oldest science. The good news is that anyone can do it. Anyone. You don't need a fancy degree. You don't need mathematics. You don't need a huge telescope. You just need your naked eye. Go outside and start observing. The good news is that amateur astronomers can and do make a major contribution to the field of astronomy. It's very, very important. First off, why do we do astronomy? Why bother? It's because, well, space is unusual. Space keeps throwing stuff at us, unusual stuff, stuff that we don't understand. At the moment, we've got a gorgeous bright comet in the sky, Comet Atlas, which is going to get even brighter towards April and May. Comets used to be seen as the harbingers of doom and gloom and despondency, and we're certainly in, that, in the United Kingdom at the moment. It's not exactly a happy, joyful place. We get things like stars, like this star Betelgeuse you might have heard in the news, which has been fading, fading at an, an alarming rate and fading far deeper than it's faded for, for hundreds of years. So we're just curious about what's going on with that. So space keeps throwing things at us. The more we look, the more we keep finding. We've got little rover, rovers ro walking around, wandering around the surface of Mars. Every time they turn up a rock, every time they look under a piece of soil, we find something new, something interesting, something that we didn't know was there before. For instance, one of the questions that we're really looking at is why is Mars so similar to Earth and yet so completely different? That's a real puzzle. And what happened on Mars, if Mars is so similar, what happened to Mars to make it the way it is now? That's the big puzzle. And is that likely to happen to Earth? That's the puzzle. Earlier this month, we found something almost completely impossible, a teardrop-shaped star. Our understanding of stars, we think, is pretty good. But then space throws it as a, a nice curved ball in the form of a teardrop-shaped teardrop star. How can that possibly be? We keep finding stuff that we just don't understand, and we've got to change and adapt our existing theories so that we get some kind of a handle on what's out there. There are other things in the sky that even amateurs can find. For instance, there is an unusual new type of aurora. We're not sure where it's come from. We've been seeing aurora for thousands of years, but this new type of aurora was discovered by amateur astronomers, and in their infinite wisdom, because they're amateur astronomers and they could, they christened it Steve. So if you ever hear anybody saying, have you seen Steve lately? It doesn't mean Steve down the pub or Steve from wherever. It means Steve, the new kind of aurora. So that's not going to be confusing, is it? On a slightly more serious note, let's look at this asteroid here. Asteroid 2020 BX12. That's a fancy name for a little asteroid. Look at the date there, 20, or the 4th of February 2020. That was the first time we managed to get a reliable image of it. This is not a photographic image. This is a radar image. 
It's what we call an Apollo group asteroid, and it was discovered for the first time on the 27th of January 2020. It's 70 meters across, and it has a moon of its own. So if you imagine, it's like Earth, but smaller with a moon of its own. It's not going to get very close to Earth. It's not going to come particularly close to Earth for some considerable time. We measure asteroids and safety distances in terms of distance from here to the moon. So 4.36 million kilometers is about 11 lunar distances. So it's, it's comfortably a long way away from us. The problem is that its orbit is potentially hazardous, that at some point in time in however long Earth lasts, it might cross our path with some interesting consequences. The problem is that before January the 27th, 2020, we didn't see it. We didn't know it was there. We hadn't got a clue it was there, and we don't have a clue how many more are out there. Knowing about what's in space is incredibly important to our survival, because obviously getting squished by a mile-wide asteroid would really put a crimp in your day. It's not a good thing to happen. So, why do amateurs do astronomy? Because space is absolutely huge. To paraphrase the late, great Douglas Adams, you thought it was a long way down to the, the uh, news agents. Space is absolutely huge. And the problem is there's so much to see, so many objects out in space, that there aren't enough professional astronomers to look everywhere at the same time. And even though we've automated much of the process of looking at the sky, there aren't enough robotic telescopes to look everywhere at the same time either. So the vast army of professional astronomers and robotic astronomers rely on amateurs to do the footwork, to do the legwork, to help cover the ground that they can't. And they do so with remarkable efficiency. It's remarkable the work that amateur astronomers do. That's amateurs just like you, just like me. Why else do amateurs do astronomy? Because it is really, really good fun. It's very, very enjoyable to go outside on a freezing cold night, um, look up at the sky and just wonder, what am I going to see next? What's out there? What's different? And also because you do see lots of really, really interesting stuff uh, all the time. Every night is different. That's what makes it so much fun. And of course, understanding the universe is it's vitally important for the future of life on Earth because we've not really taken good care of this small blue planet, have we? We've not looked after it particularly well. And frankly, we're very much in need of a lifeboat. So figuring out where we can go next as in a lifeboat it would be a good thing to start doing now rather than before it really is too late. Okay, some of the objects that are out there, some of these objects you will be familiar with, intimately familiar with, some not so much. First of all, the sun. The sun, which we've seen an awful lot of in this part of the world today, it's been absolutely gorgeous weather outside, lovely clear skies, lovely warm air. It provides the light, all of the heat that comes to us, causes our weather, but there is a problem with the sun at the moment. The sun is currently very inactive, and the sun should be very active. And the trouble is, we don't know why the sun is so inactive. The sun today, if you look, a, look at the sun with a special kind of telescope, don't have a look at the sun with binoculars or a small telescope, you need to use proper filtering or you could lose your sight, so don't. If you look at the sun today with a special kind of telescope, it's completely blank. Not a single sunspot, and it's been that way for several years. And the number of sunspot we see relates to the amount of energy that the sun is sending our way. So the sun has got lots of sunspots, we know it's sending a lot of energy our way. When the sun's not got many sunspots, we know it's fairly inactive. This is what we'd expect to see when the sun is quite active, in the middle of its solar cycle. Under normal circumstances, we'd expect to see quite a few sunspots. But, as I said at the moment, there are none or very, very few. The puzzle is, why is it the sun is so active? What's happened? Have we entered a period similar to uh, the Victorian era, when it got very, very cold, the River Thames froze, even the River Tyne, not far from where I live, that froze. We experienced almost a mini ice age. So has the sun's output diminished to the point where we're entering a mini ice age? Will effectively global warming save us from a mini ice age? Well, that's fine. If the sun goes cold, global warming heats up the atmosphere, everybody wins, unless the sun suddenly starts putting out more energy again, which it might do. In which case we are then hit with a double whammy of a sun putting out far more energy and an awful lot of greenhouse gases. So we really need to start planning for the future about greenhouse gases and about global warming. Because we're not talking about now or in the next five years, we're talking about when the sun starts to get active again. 
which can be very, very risky. So with that cheery thought in mind, let's see what else is out there. At the moment, we've got a lovely show of the planets. There are four really bright major planets on shore. Venus is absolutely gorgeous just after sunset. Jupiter, Mars and Saturn are all gorgeous objects first thing in the morning. And we'll come to those later. Also, the moon. The moon is starting a new cycle. It's in day two or day three of its current cycle. It's our nearest neighbour in space, the only place in the universe other than Earth that we visited in person. And curiously, it's not made of cheese. I include that for two reasons. Firstly, because my grandmother insisted that the moon was made of cheese, although she was quite, quite potty, um, and also to see if anybody's paying attention, which I can't tell because I've got a trap muted. Okay, it's also the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landings on the moon, July 1969 last year. There were moon landings going on well into 1970, 1972 as well. But it was a special time this time last year. It was, we had a lovely time celebrating the moon landings, all that adventure that took place 50 years ago. One small step for man, said Neil Armstrong, one giant leap for mankind. One very sleepless night for a small boy, because I was age seven, sitting nervously on my couch at four in the morning. There you go. Buzz Aldrin christened it as best he possibly could. Magnificent desolation was how he described it. Absolutely marvellous. And it really is, it's just a desolate desert of rock and dirt and a few things that we human beings have left there as well now. And one day we'll go back and prove that they were still, we left them there. 50 years of the moon landings, we did some good science up there. We started to figure out where the moon came from, how the moon and the earth are inextricably linked. What might happen to the earth in future is based on what happened on the moon now. We collected an awful lot of rock samples, about 400 kilograms of rock samples, and believe it or not, we are still analyzing some of those rock samples now. Amazing. We are going to return to the moon. Not this year, probably. Probably not next year either, with this unfortunate virus thing going on. But almost certainly by 2024, we will have landed astronauts on the moon again almost certainly put astronauts on the moon. Why bother going back to the moon? Because, well, we're running out of resources here. We're running out of room, we're running out of resources, and the Earth could become uninhabitable, either by our own action or by some action of nature. That's the thing that we've got to start thinking about now before it becomes dangerous later on. The planet Mars is very much in the news lately. We've got this gorgeous little rover called Curiosity trundling around the surface of Mars. It keeps sending us back some wonderful images of the surface of Mars. If you want to actually see Mars now, get up at about 5.30 in the morning. That's a bit of an ask, I suppose, but the sky is getting nice and bright in the mornings. Get up early in the morning, look roughly southeast, and you should see three bright objects close together in the sky. They are the major planets Saturn, Mars and Jupiter. Jupiter will be the brightest of them at the moment. Mars is just sitting between the two. It's not particularly bright, but it's worth getting a pair of binoculars on. Okay, this is an image sent back from the surface of Mars by the Curiosity rover. It is not a Hollywood special effect. This is not some trick of the camera or some computer graphic. This is real. This is tire tracks made on the surface of another planet by a robot that we are programming here on Earth. The rocks that you see littered around are what's left over of Mars' geology. And Mars' geology has got us completely puzzled at the moment. What happened on Mars? What made Mars the way it is now? And can that happen to us here on Earth? Here's another gorgeous image showing just the Martian's horizon deep into the distance. Could spend hours looking at that, and I do. Mars is christened the red planet precisely because it's red, because it's got so much iron oxide in its atmosphere and in the rocks. It's roughly the same age, I say, and roughly the same size, ish, ish. They're not identicals. They're not blood brothers. They're not sisters, these two planets. They are closely similar, but not identical. There's a lot of effort going in to find out if there might have been life on Mars at some point in time in the past. And a group of scientists steadfastly argue that there may well be life on Mars now. We just got to go look for it. What kind of life it might it be? Little green men, aliens and monsters, strange men, even stranger women? Probably not. Almost certainly if there's anything left moving around on Mars, it's going to be bacteria. It's going to be small, harmless, probably insignificant. 
Now, this image that I'm showing you there is an image that was captured from a meteorite that we believe came from Mars that crash landed in the Antarctic. It came from Mars because its magnetic field matches that of Mars. It matches everything we know about the geology of Mars. And yet we can't tell if that's a fossilized microbe on the surface of the meteorite or if it's a piece of geology from Mars that makes it unique. So we're stuck. We don't know if that's bacteria or something else. Is there any other life on Mars? Probably. Insignificant. Could be something else entirely. We're not entirely sure. We don't know yet. Pretty sure it's not one of those. When I do this sort of class in with my, my school children, I tell them, someday someone will set foot on Mars, probably within the next few years. Could it be you? It could be. And always, always, universally, these kids jump up and down and say, yes, I want it to be me. Why can't it be me? And that's a fantastic aspiration to have. It could be one of them. So as Jupiter, as I pointed out, first thing in the morning, Jupiter, biggest planet in our solar system, again, look southeast just before the sun comes up. Jupiter is very, very big. Many astronomers used to reckon that it was a failed star. It's simply not big enough to be a failed star. It's just a very, very big planet. We used to think it had around 60 moons. The number of moons has just been bumped up to over 80. We're confident there's even more. And at the moment, we're getting the most fantastic images back from Jupiter. This, this image came back from the Juno probe, which is currently going doing the rounds. It's in an odd orbit around Jupiter. It's sending back the most fantastic images of the Jupiter cloud belts. These are photographs taken of the four Galilean moons, so-called because they were discovered by the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei in the 1600s, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io. And the good news with these moons is that you don't need a great big fancy telescope. You could go out tomorrow morning, point a pair of binoculars at Jupiter, and you'd probably, you'd stand a good chance of seeing at least one or two of these four moons. They are that big, they are visible with a small telescope of binoculars. You don't need specialist equipment. And it's interesting to watch these little objects dance around the outside of uh, Jupiter, because that's exactly how Galileo recorded them. Galileo, in his notebooks back in 1600s, referred to them as fireflies just objects that dance around. He reckoned that they were in orbit around Jupiter. And coming up with that sort of conclusion was dangerous and risky and put him up his house arrest in front of the Spanish courts, uh, sorry, the Italian courts. He ended up in front of the Inquisition, placed under house arrest. So, probably not a good thing. Where's Saturn? Saturn is exactly beside um, Mars and Jupiter. It's an example, perfect example of harmony and motion, those beautiful, beautiful rings that we see in orbit. Saturn is not unique in having a ring system. It's pretty unique in having a ring system that is so obvious. Now these photographs, that photograph on the right there looks like a bath sponge. It's in fact close up of one of Saturn's moons called Hyperion. It's one of the shepherd moons, which is responsible for keeping Saturn's moon rings in shape. These tiny little lumps of rock shepherd and herd the dust particles that make up the rings into these gorgeous structures. They're not fixed and permanent. They do move around, they do shift. And we've sent probes up there, the little Cassini-Huygens probe went up there and photographed these rings changing around and moving around under the influence of these so-called shepherd moons. Truly fascinating. The evening sky tonight, just after sunset, we're blessed to see the planet Venus just sitting there. Venus, if you look with a small telescope or binoculars, you can quite clearly see that it is like our moon. It has phases. It's called an interior planet, which means it orbits the sun inside the orbit of the Earth. We'll come back to this one later on. The planet Venus, we used to think Venus was a lush, green, verdant planet that was Earth's sister, a lovely place to go and live down there. Lots of adventures on the surface of Venus. We've since discovered that Venus is incredibly hot, probably covered in inactive volcanoes, though one or two of those volcanoes may still be active. When it rains, it reels, rains a real acid rain, not pretend acid rain, real sulfuric acid. And I ask my children if I go there, I say, would you like to go there for a holiday? And nearly all of them, nearly all of them say, yes, please, we'd love to, I wouldn't like to go, but they would love to go to Venus for a holiday. Makes you think, doesn't it? Anyway. We come to the outer planets, we've looked at the inner planets, the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune. 
I mentioned Neptune because there's a theory that says, don't you need a huge telescope to see Neptune? Well, you don't actually. You just need to be in the right place at the right time. Earlier this year, it just happened to be that Venus was within a degree or so in the sky of Neptune. So all you had to do is point your telescope in the direction of Venus and Neptune, the planet Neptune, was in your field of view. So here's this planet on the very edge of our solar system and you can see it for yourself. With, well, also in this case, it was quite a nice telescope, um, but it's possible to see Neptune for yourself. You don't need a very big expensive telescope to do that. What about Pluto? Whenever I do this kind of talk, I am asked, what about Pluto? What happened to Pluto? Why was Pluto relegated? Why is Pluto no longer a member of the sun's family? Well, simply because we started looking out into space and we started to discover lots of other planets, minor planets, dwarf planets that were all bigger than Pluto. And as soon as we started to find objects that were bigger than Pluto, Pluto was automatically relegated to being a dwarf planet. These are the best photographs that we had taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we can't see much surface detail, even those edges, those shapes are artificially created. We can't see very much from Hubble. But not long ago, we sent a space probe called New Horizons out to check out Pluto, to see what was there. And it started to send back the most fantastic pictures, the most fantastic images that show Pluto to be a most remarkable world, truly remarkable, an atmosphere of its own, it has rocky surface features. It has geology much the same as ours, terrain very similar to what we find on other planets in the solar system. Truly, truly remarkable. Here's a gorgeous photograph of Pluto's atmosphere backlit by the light of the sun. We can see mountain ranges. We can see vast open glaciers, all sorts of incredible details. Here's a close-up of a similar image. So you can see, so Pluto, even though it's on the very edge of our solar system, it's a foreign alien world to us. It has so much in common with life and our own planet Earth. Here's almost one of my favorite pictures ever. This is Pluto as the New Horizons spacecraft flew away from it. It was a one-off mission. It didn't go into orbit around Pluto. It just flew past taking photographs as it went by. And here is a ring in space. Here is Pluto's atmosphere backlit by the sun, the light from the sun. As soon as those images came in, us astronomers, the amateurs as well, NASA made all of these images freely available to the public. We jumped on them like a small dog jumping on a small bone. And we started to analyze those images and look to figure out what we were looking at. And then we started to come up with some really, really, eh, what's, what's that? What's that? And of course, the media got a hold of it. And certain publications who will remain completely nameless, um, will not mention them at all jumped to the conclusion and concluded that these objects bobbing around on the surface of Venus were in fact giant space snails, and they said so publicly. But we're cleverer than that. Astronomers are cleverer than that. We don't jump to conclusions. No, it wasn't. In fact, we see in exactly the same phenomena on Earth, rocks caught between shifting ice plates or rocks on desert plains is exactly the same phenomena. Shifting stones on Death Valley, Arizona. They move of their own accord. It's an unusual process involving melting water in a desert. So, I probably got that wrong. Correct. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But it's nothing like space snails. It's nothing like the, gut, the headlines. Whatever you do, if you ever read something in the newspapers, check the source, check the data, make sure they've got the facts right. Don't believe it for yourself. Always check. Because sometimes they've not exactly got it right. Stars, we're very, very interested in stars. The sun is also a star. It's the closest star to us. It's our very own laboratory for studying stars. There are lots of stars in the skies. There's a particularly gorgeous group of stars called the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. You can see it in the sky tonight if you know where to look. We find lots and lots of different stars out in space. Binary, triple, triplet, multiple star systems, variable stars, globular star clusters, and downright weird stars. We also find other puzzling things, planet in orbit, planets in orbit around multiple stars. Does that sound familiar? Not long ago, we jumped for joy. We leapt in circles. We, we were so happy. We'd found Tatooine, Luke Skywalker's home planet. We found a planet orbiting a distant star system. I won't give you the name of it. It's some complicated number, HD something or other, that exactly matches the orbit of Tatooine and Luke Skywalker's home planet in the Star Wars franchise. We were so happy. 
So thrilled. See, science fiction throws all sorts of wonderful ideas at us, and it's up to astronomers to prove them true or false. Other objects in the sky, galaxies. We live in an enormous galaxy called the Milky Way. We don't perceive it as a galaxy because we live right in the middle of it. What we see as our galaxy is in fact the strip of lights called the Milky Way. Clouds and clouds of stars up above us, gas and clouds and bits of all sorts of things. There are numerous other galaxies. Everywhere we look in space, we see multiple galaxies, hundreds of thousands and billions of galaxies. This is one such galaxy called the Sombrero Hat Galaxy because it looks like a sombrero hat, is the closest galaxy to our own, the Andromeda Galaxy. The big concern is, for us is that we, the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, are heading towards each other. And in about 12 billion years, or thereabouts, might be a little bit less, a little bit more, the two will collide. The Andromeda Galaxy will merge with the Milky Way Galaxy and a whole new galaxy will be born. So that's interesting as well. Won't bother us because we'll have gone to dust long before then. This is a strange and unique and interesting photograph. Many years ago, NASA decided to try an experiment. They found the most boring, tedious, dull area of the Milky Way, of the sky. They pointed the Hubble Space Telescope in that particular direction, and they left the camera shutter open for 17 days. And at the end of that 70 days, 17 days, one seven, they looked at the image that they'd got, and every last little pixel of that particular image was covered in galaxies. Now, there are only one, two, three, four, five stars in this entire picture. Every other little blob that you are looking at is a galaxy in its own right. Like the Milky Way, there are so many of them, and this is just the most boring pit of the, the universe. So what else is out there? As I said, space is phenomenally big, space is phenomenally complicated, and there aren't enough astronomers to go around and study all of this to make sense of it all. As I mentioned earlier on, the ongoing missions, the Juno probe at Jupiter has been sending the most breathtaking images back to us. These are all free for you to look at and to analyze and to image process if you wish. These are computer enhanced to bring out some of the detail, but the fresh images, the raw images are available for you to look at. They're sent back by this little Juno probe, it's in what we call a polar orbit, and is sending back the most remarkable images showing the complexity in Jupiter's cloud structure. We're seeing all sorts of ovals, rotating hurricanes, storms. There's a weird hexagonal shaped storm going on at Jupiter's poles that we don't have a clue about. The great red spot that we've been seeing for about 400 years, and Galileo was one of the first astronomers to see, if not the first astronomer to see it, and we're, it, it's fading. The great red spot on Jupiter is fading, and we don't know why. At some point in time in the near future, we're not going to be able to call it the great red spot anymore. We're just going to call it the red spot. This looks like a still from a Hollywood movie. It's not. It's a genuine photograph taken by the Juno probe. Uh, you might think it comes from the movie 2010, Space Odyssey 2, but it's in fact one of Jupiter's moons um, leaving a shadow leaving a shadow, transiting across the surface of uh, Jupiter. So not faked at all. This sort of thing is available for you to download from the NASA websites completely free of charge. There are lots and lots of missions ongoing at the moment. One of the most exciting is the InSight lander. It is a little seismic probe to discover the seismic activity on the planet Mars. It's done some remarkable work proving that we used to think Mars was dead geologically. There was very little going on. But in fact, no, Mars is in fact incredibly active. Something like 150 to 180 Mars quakes have gone on since insight set down on the surface of Mars in November 20, 2018. Very, very interesting. It keeps sending back pictures showing it. pretty much what Victor, uh, Curiosity rover sends us back. But it's got these little seismic tools that sit on the surface. It's got a little mole for drilling, dilling, uh, drilling under the surface of Mars, pulling soil samples up, testing the way everything works on Mars. It sends back weather reports on a daily basis. You can see what the weather's like on Mars in terms of temperature and pressure and wind speed. All of this is available should you feel the need to look. The ongoing space mission, the New Horizons probe, as I said, shot past Pluto. It's on its way to a new target. It passed this target called Ultima Thule not so long ago and found a, a strange, dirty snowman floating in space, about 21 miles, as far as you can possibly imagine out into the, uh, the, the depths of the solar system. And it's on its way to a new target as well. 
So it will keep going until it passes the edge of the solar system and moves into interstellar space. Of course, it's fun to follow the adventures of the International Space Station. I will give you some news about the International Space Station a little bit later on. But the ongoings, the adventures in there are just worth following on a day-to-day -day basis. They, they have some fun. They do a lot of really good science up there. It's a habitat. It's learning to live in outer space, learning the rigors and demands of what it's like to work in space, to look down at planet Earth and to figure out what's going on. Send some wonderful pictures back just to say, you know, this is fun. We should be doing this. Last question, winding down. Can amateur astronomers make a difference? Can you go out there tonight and see something unusual? See something that nobody else has seen before? I hope to prove that, that you can. An American amateur astronomer, not so long ago, 2015, pointed his telescope at the planet Mars. Just a little amateur telescope and he noticed something unusual about the planet Mars. Dust plumes rising high into the Martian atmosphere. And, uh, you know, somebody from one of the tabloid newspapers might declare, oh no, the Martians are coming, it's an alien invasion. He recognized it for what it was, just dust plumes, but dust plumes rising that high into the atmosphere. Nobody's seen them before, not even NASA had seen them at the time. They weren't looking, none of the probes were in that particular area. This guy, Wayne Dretschke, went onto the internet, told a couple of friends, and within hours he'd had confirmation of his, of his discovery. Other amateur astronomers jumped in and said, here we are, look what's going on. A retired vicar, currently based in either Australia or New Zealand, Richard Evans, Ro Robert Evans, sorry, Robert Evans, um, he took up the hobby of spotting supernova in distant galaxies. When a star, a big star, reaches the end of its life, it goes bang. It goes bang in a most spectacular manner. Thankfully, there have been no supernova explosions in our part of the Milky Way for some considerable time, so we don't have to worry about it. But supernova explosions in distant galaxies are relatively common. And our retired vicar, he discovered his first in 1955. He's still going, aged 83. He's discovered more than 40 of these things. And he is a humble amateur astronomer, a retired vicar, retired Methodist preacher, he just knows the sky like the back of his hand. He can look at a distant galaxy and figure out, oh, that's different. Here's another discovery. So yes, amateurs can make a difference. Oh, it's another 50. I stand corrected. Comet Borisov, which is an unusually named Comet Borisov, was discovered in August 29 by a Russian amateur astronomer, Gennady Borisov, which is where it gets its name from. He discovered it. He gets to christen the comet. It's a special comet, it's an unusual comet, because this comet's orbit means it came from another star system altogether. It's not from inside our solar system, it's not a member of the sun's family, it came from somewhere else. And the big puzzle with Comet Bozorisov is it's past our sun and it's heading back out into interstellar space from whence it came. But curiously, it's starting to break up. And we don't understand why that might be so. Because it's so far away from the sun's influence, it should be more stable. So what's happening now that it's leaving the solar system is it's breaking up. So why? We haven't got a, a good explanation, and that's a puzzle. Amateur observations, amateur astronomers going through di digital data on a comet 29P discovered these weird cryovolcanoes, ice volcanoes that spew ice out into space later proven by probes that went to visit the same comet. So amateurs can do that. You don't actually need a telescope to do that. You just need to look at data and understand how the data works. That's a bit more complicated than your average amateur astronomer can do, but you get the idea. But as still, during the most, one of the most recent lunar eclipses, 21st of January, 2019, I know it well. I was watching it from my little observatory not far from Durham. We had a live television feed watching this thing going on. And it was a beautiful sight. The moon went salmon pink as it went into the Earth's shadow. And a number of amateur astronomers said, hang on a minute, did you spot that? A bright flash on the side of the moon that was in shadow. They rang around the internet, checked with a bunch of other observers. Yep, there had been a bright flash on the side of the moon that was in shadow during the moon lunar, they saw the lunar eclipse. It turned out to have been a small asteroid, a small lump of rock, about the size of the football, had impacted on the, mar the, the lunar surface whilst the eclipse was in progress. So that's another thing. We had no idea 
turns out that these things happen all the time. It turns out that the moon is regularly bombarded with small rocks that we can't normally see. It just so happened that this part of the moon was in darkness and we weren't really looking for it. So this is how amateur astronomers can and do make a major difference to astronomers. So the answer is, can amateur astronomers make a difference? The answer is yes, absolutely. You certainly can. So the final part of tonight's talk is we're going to ask the question, what can I see tonight? Because you're all chomping at the bit. You all want to go and find out what can I see? What can we go on? I want to see something now. Satisfy my urge to go and look at the sky. Well, the easiest object you can find in the sky tonight is the moon. The moon is just into a new cycle. It's two days old. So it's a thin, thin sliver. If I had my blinds open, I'd be able to see it out of my window. It's a thin sliver over in the west, just not far away from the sun. You should, with a bit of luck, be able to see that the sun has a, sorry, the moon has a thin sliver, but it's also slightly brighter on the side that is in shadow. And that is called earth shine. That is the sun's light reflected off the earth, bouncing up towards the moon and reflected back off the moon, back down to earth. So that those light beams have undergone a strange and unusual path. That's called earth shine. What else can you see? The planet Venus is very, very easy to see tonight. Very, very bright. As long as it's not cloudy and looking out my window in the other direction, I can see not a single cloud in the sky. So I know what I'm doing after dinner. That's my evening sorted. If you look at Venus with a small telescope or a pair of binoculars, you should be able to see this gorgeous little half moon shape. Now, because Venus is an interior planet and it is just past the point that we call Western elongation, that's a posh astronomical term for saying the furthest it can get from the sun in the sky. It means it's on its inward path. Now, Venus will turn into a very thin sliver, a very thin sliver indeed, and it will be moving very, very quickly. So if you get a couple of nights where you're not, not able to see Venus at all as cloud cover, or you simply forget, there's a good chance that you will miss it altogether. However, if you do get a chance to see it, you will see an absolute joy a thin sliver just like our own moon in the sky. Venus will also be incredibly bright as well. Venus will even cast shadows if you do your test properly. What else can you see? If you know where to look in the sky, there's a comet, Comet Atlas. It's in the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. It's a little difficult to see at the moment. Binoculars and a small telescope will find it. But this comet has brightened dramatically in the last few months. It began as a small plus 18 magnitude comet, little dusty blob. It has since brightened to about plus eight, and estimates show that by the end of May, it will certainly be naked eye, and certainly visible probably very, very easily, not long after sunset. So we could, we're overdue for a really nice bright comet. And I think Comet Atlas may fulfill that bill. If you know what you're looking for, you can probably go out tonight with a pair of binoculars, but I, my astronomy observing colleagues at Sunderland Astronomical Society inform me that it is a real neck breaker. You have to put your neck into a really difficult position to be actually able to see it properly, such as the difficult angle in the sky. So that's Comet Atlas. The International Space Station I mentioned earlier on, it passes over the United Kingdom in about 10 minutes actually, but only for observers below about York. Um, if you're above York, you're gonna to have to wait until 2025, thereabouts, tonight. That's about 25 past eight. If you go outside at about 25 past eight, look towards the west, you will see an object moving fairly slowly against the background of stars. It will get brighter and brighter and brighter, and eventually it will be as bright as the planet Venus. It will pass not far from the planet Venus as well. And then it will pass directly overhead. You notice the International Space Station because it doesn't have any navigation lights on. Where it is, it doesn't need navigation lights, but it is particularly easy to spot. And it's important to remember that you are looking at a tin can that's been in orbit for 20 years and is currently home to about six astronauts. And it's been continuously occupied ever since. Um, it's a lovely sight. If you can, go out and see it. I have posted up some information on the screen here. This is for anybody in London. 
you get a couple of passes this week. Um, I will circulate these details, put these details somewhere so people can find them. Screen snapshot that if you possibly can. The important details are tonight for London Observers at about 28 minutes past eight. You can see a good pass then, be one of the best ones. For observers close further north, Newcastle upon Tynes, it's just as bright, um, but it happens a little bit earlier, at about 27 minutes past eight. Uh, the further north you get, it happens a little bit earlier. It's just the way orbital mechanics works. So I'll put those details up at the end of the talk if I possibly can, if there's an opportunity to do that. But that is something remarkable and compelling for you to see tonight. So finally, what is astronomy? What is astronomy? Astronomy is a huge subject. There's so much astronomy to do and there aren't enough astronomers to do it. There's always something new to see, something else to get involved in. It's an absolutely huge subject. We're not just talking about optical astronomy, talking about photographic astronomy, radio astronomy, different kinds of astronomy. You don't need a degree, a lot of maths, or a telescope to get started. You can do so tonight with your naked eye. Just go outside and have a look at the sky. Figure out what these little pinpoints of light are, these little constellations, these distant stars. Figure out what some of the brighter ones might be. Some of them will be satellites, some of them will be planets, some of them will be space stations. Knowing what's in space and getting yourself an education about what's going on in the sky above you is vitally important to the survival of our species. Because we may not get a second chance. The dinosaurs didn't, and they aren't, and they aren't around anymore. So getting a handle on what's in space is vitally important to our survival. Space isn't all about what's up there, it's about what's down on the ground. There's a gorgeous, gorgeous photograph I managed, managed to find this afternoon showing the United Kingdom virtually cloud-free. My apologies to our Scottish viewers, uh, as ever you were covered in cloud. But there you go, you get an idea of where I live. You can even see, you know, I'm waving at you, sort of. Space isn't about what's up there, it's about learning where we came from and ultimately what will become of us, because ultimately the sun will run out of energy, the sun will turn into a giant star, and eventually it will turn into what we call a planetary nebula. We will have long since gone to dust. Humanity, with a bit of luck, will have headed off to the distant stars, maybe Alpha Centauri, maybe it's found somewhere really cool to exist on the far rim of another galaxy, but that's for another day another subject to discuss. Astronomy is all about what will become of us, where we've been. It's also incredibly good fun. Astronomy is not all about learning stuff. It's really good fun to just go outside and look at the sky, study it, be inspired. But sometimes astronomy is all about just laugh out loud funny. Sometimes very rarely you find something that's genuinely funny. Yes, NASA did fix the InSight lander by telling itself to hit itself with a shovel. This little object that you can see tunneling into the Martian surface got stuck because the Martian soil is a little heavier and a little clumpier than we expected. And we couldn't get the mole free. We couldn't break it free. So they told this little lander to hit itself with a shovel. Yeah, they did. And it makes you think of Bugs Bunny, Marvin the Martian. And it makes you laugh out loud. And that's what makes astronomy worthwhile, because it really is an absolutely fantastic subject. And that is me. If you want to know more about astronomy, if you want to do weird courses in astronomy, we currently support an awful lot of astronomical subjects. Um, at the moment, the search engine is only displaying four. Fair number. Here's my own course in Durham. Um, starts again in April, or it may run virtually in cyberspace if we haven't found a cure for this wretched virus. I run a little astronomical society, but it's sponsored by WE, supported by us It's a blog, an astronomy-related blog, david-hughes-astronomy.org.uk. Um, I keep people updated on what's going on in my courses. I occasionally add some strange writings on there. I try to keep people informed of what's going on in the sky. It's a useful set of resources to try and figure out. If you want to know more about my own course, and about, more importantly, the courses that we do for the Royal Astronomical Society, because it is the 200th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society, and uh, there are, were a number of events going on around the country to help celebrate that fact. And we've, WEA, in association with the Royal Astronomical Society, we've been organizing 
a significant number of online courses, of video courses very like this, uh, Canvas courses that you sit down and work through, all about astronomy to help you learn a bit more about the sky and what's, in, what's going on around you. And that, I think, is it.